Well, we've been talking about boldness uh, in the last few weeks, and this is part five uh, of my series on Take Bold Steps. I will be concluding next week with part six of Take Bold Steps. God wants us to be bold people. He doesn't want us to be people who feel small about ourselves, think small about ourselves, and speak small about ourselves. There is something called stage fright. And it is the kind of feeling people have when they stand before an audience. Uh, any one of you who has had to stand before people to either sing or, or to deliver a speech or say a poem or, or do something publicly might have encountered stage fright. People are very confident, confident before the mirror, confident in the shower, confident alone before their family members until it's performance time. And many times people freeze, don't know what to say. People who are otherwise very talented act very timid and afraid. And that comes about because there is a deficit of boldness in our actions. And today we're going to look at something related to that because God wants you to be bold in private. He also wants you to be bold in public. Whether you are standing before one or before a thousand, God wants you to be confident and he wants you to put out your best. Somebody say, I'm bold. Amen. You're not only going to be bold when you are in secret, you're going to be bold when you are standing uh, before an audience. And many times what lets us down uh, is not really uh, who we are, but how we allow the way people see us to put us down. So we're going to look at a story in the Bible. It's in Acts of the Apostles, and it's in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. And I'll give you, uh, uh, f uh, actually, chapter 4, verses 5 and to 7. And I'll give you a background. In chapter 3 of Acts of the Apostles, the, the two of the apostles of Jesus Christ, Peter and John, go to the temple. And they enter through one of the gates of the temple called the Beautiful Gate and find a man who has been crippled for a very long time. And God uses them tremendously and this man is healed. There's great news around the temple and in Jerusalem. People come in and they are astonished that these disciples of Jesus have healed a crippled man. It's good news, and it brings in good people. But as every good news does, it also brings in bad people. Your good news will let people praise you. It will also want bring in people who want to kill you. And so... Uh, the disciples of Jesus are hauled before the Jewish Sanhedrin and they have to now make a defense before these elders. So let's look at the account of it. Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So where, is, where are Peter and John? Where are they located? The Bible says that they are before the rulers, the elders, the scribes, the high priests all before the elite of Jerusalem. This is the highest place to be, the Jewish Sahindrin. It's made up of the most brilliant people. It's made up of great uh, theologians and scribes. It's made up of uh, lawyers uh, of the law. It's made up of the high priests. This is it. And the disciples of Jesus are brought before the elite, the elders of the land, the Sanhedrin. 
It's like you standing before the Supreme Court of Ghana or standing before an academic board of a university to present a defense for your thesis, if you've written one, or being invited before the board of directors of your company. This is big deal. They're standing on the biggest platform of their day before the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin are not very, very excited about Peter and John. Now, one of the things you're going to note about life is that sometimes your success will throw you before a very terrifying audience. And sometimes your vision, your drive, is going to bring you before people you are scared of. And if you are a performer like we see uh, our singers do every Sunday, you stand before this audience and some of you are very difficult. You are the Sanhedrin of Christ's temple. You don't clap. You don't smile. The singers are doing their best. They are pushing hard and you're just singing, watching them like the elders. And it's very difficult when you stand before people who don't seem to be emotionally moved by what you're doing. Then you wonder, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Should I go on? Should I stop? Am I really accepted before this sun hindering? So Peter and John are before the rulers, the elders, the scribes, the high priests, the elite. Now, when we look at verse 13 of the same book of Acts, chapter 4, this is the Sanhedrin and their view. It says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Very interesting passage there. I will unpack it a little. First is how the elite perceived Peter and John. How did they see Peter and John? Peter and John are before the people. But how did the people perceive them? You know, all of us want people to think well of us. When you stand before people, you're before an interview panel, you're wondering, is my hair well combed? Am, am, I, am I speaking well? Is there, is there something on my shirt? And especially if you see people looking at you in a very peculiar way, you start, self-doubt start coming in. You just wonder, maybe my hair is not cold. Maybe my breath is not good. And that's a bad thing in an interview, when your breath is going across the table. It can, it can really hurt. So you brush your teeth, brush your teeth till your gums are bleeding. And yet you are there wondering, is my breath a problem? Am I smelling good? Am I looking good? Why are they looking at me like that? So that's how Peter and John might have felt. And the Bible tells us how the elite perceived them. The Bible says they saw them as uneducated men. Uneducated men. In the Greek, the word is agramatos. Grammatos is where we get grammar. Words, knowledge. A is not. So in Greek, A is not. Grammatos is education. So they are a educated or uneducated. They don't have grammar. That means that they are unable to write. They are illiterate. That's how they were perceived. The, 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 the elite of the society looked at these guys and said, these are a bunch of illiterates. A bunch of illiterates. They are not educated people. Of course, they speak the language, but they don't speak it with polish. They don't speak it with finesse. They don't speak it like people who have 
learned how to use the language. So instantly, their speech betrayed them as uneducated people. Secondly, the Bible says that the elite, the Sanhedrin, perceived them as untrained people. The Greek word for untrained in this passage is idiotes. You don't need translation for that. I don't need that. The Greek and the English are very idiotes. In, the, in other words, idiots. So they saw the disciples of Jesus. They said, these guys, not only are, not, are they not educated, but they are idiots. Backward people. Today, we would say they are bush people. So, you stand before great people and they already have disqualified you. You are uneducated and you are bush. And the reason they say that they are, they are bush people, I don't know. Maybe it's their mannerism. Maybe it's the way they talk. Maybe it's the way they pick their nose. I don't know what Peter and John were doing, but these guys look at them and say, what kind of bush people do we have in front of us? These are guys from Galilee. Galilee is far away, and they are fishermen from Galilee. They are not Polish people. They've not been to school, and they are bush. It's not their fault that they are bush. They just grew in the bush. I mean, is a person, is it your fault that you are a villager? No, you were born in a village. Is it your fault that you are uneducated? Probably not. Nobody took you to school or you sat in the classroom and numbers didn't make sense to you and alphabets just didn't make sense to you. So probably you were last in class for so long that after some time you just said enough is enough. This school, I'm not going again. So well, this is Peter and John. We see them today as great apostles. We revere them. When you see paintings of Peter and John, there is a halo, a light around them. And they seem like very great people. But before the Sanhedrin, they were agramatos and idiotes. They were uneducated, bush people. Now, how do you present yourself to a people who already think you are disqualified? Because, you know, many times when we are before a group and we think we don't match up, your English doesn't match up, your language doesn't match up, they talk about things and, and you're confused, they talk about food and you don't know whether it's food they are talking about or they are talking about furniture. Because uh, uh, foie gras, we'll eat the foie gras first. I'm sure you'll say, Pastor, what is that? It's foie gras. And you don't know what foie gras is. Is it furniture? Is it a new car? It is foie gras. And so sometimes you can be before people and they're using words and you say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Because nothing they say makes sense, but you are supposed to make sense. You're supposed to discourse with them. You're supposed to speak with them. You're supposed to present yourself. So here is Peter and John, perceived as uneducated, perceived as bush people, but how did they perceive themselves? How did they act before these elite people? And the Bible tells us how they acted. How they presented themselves. The Bible says they presented themselves with boldness. Everybody say boldness. That word bold that is used here in its root meaning has connotations of freedom. In other words, although they were seen like Uneducated people, they acted like free people. They didn't act like people who were intimidated. They, they, they acted freely. They acted freely. 
And that's what boldness is. First, it is freedom to be who you are in the midst of people who devalue you. Freedom to be who you are. That's a big freedom. Because for most of us, especially in this age, I, I sometimes I have serious concerns about our young people. In this social media age, Instagram age, TikTok age, people are posting all kinds of pictures. People are trying to sell themselves on the internet. And sometimes, if, if you're not careful, your, your whole life is going to be a life of pretense. Trying to match up. Trying to be something the elite will approve of. Trying to say things so that people will clap for us. And sometimes we all get caught up in that. Where we are never sure of ourselves. But these two disciples, they were sure of themselves. They spoke with boldness. They were free to be themselves. But it's not just freedom to be yourself, but also freedom to think. Freedom to think. Freedom to think. To think and to own your thoughts. And to know this is what I think. You may not think much of it, but that's what I think. And it also means freedom to speak. Freedom of speech. Freedom to speak. So Peter and John are before the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin looks at them and says, these are miserable people from the bush. They're not educated. But in my mind's eye, I can see Peter and John standing in a poise that makes these snobbish, educated people look at them and say, why are they not intimidated? Why? They're speaking. And their English is. As we say in, in Ghana, their English is corn and granite. It's mixed up. They are, their tenses are just flying all over the place. But they are speaking it confidently. Have you ever met people who are speaking bad English? But they are speaking with a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. and, they're, they're, and they're using the words poorly and they're, and they're pronouncing words poorly but they are so supremely confident that you listen to them and yet you can also find people who are educated who are so not confident that you don't want to listen to anything they say Peter and John were not thinking about how to dot their I's and cross their T's and how to be acceptable. They just wanted to express their experience and their reality, grammar or no grammar. It's okay to speak good English. And I would encourage everybody, especially if you are in our part of the world, you have to speak good English. You have to. It is just necessary. You say, but, but it's not my language. Well, it's your language. English is our language. Anybody who says English is not our language is, 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 is not thinking correctly. English is our language. Why? Because if you go to any platform in the world and you ask Ghana, official language, it's English. I mean, if your official language is not your language, then what is your language? That's what? Go everywhere and check. What is the official language of Ghana? It's English. How it came to be English, I'm not going to debate that. But what I'm saying is, it is the official language. If you don't speak it, you are not official. <laughs> I 
I didn't make the rules. You can say, let's change it. Yeah, that's another debate. But as of now, it is the official language. If you go to parliament, you have to speak English. If you don't speak it, you'll be a member without contribution. <laughs> there are some parliamentarians who sit in parliament and they feel like Peter and John. People see them as idiotes and agramatos. And they just keep quiet for the whole session of parliament, never making contribution. But when they are in their constituency and they are speaking the gown, hey! <laughs> oh, they are speaking the chi. And they are bringing proverbs and all kinds of... Then they go to parliament and they are quiet. <laughs> Agramatos idiotos idiotos. <laughs> That's the problem. So, so, but Peter and John, although they are agramatos and idiotes, they are bold. I may not know it. I may not have sat in a classroom, but I have a mind. I have a thought. I have an idea. I have a belief, and I'm going to express it. And if you don't, if you say parliament is for English, I will say the English that I know. I will box it up with whatever, <coughs> whatever way I will, but I will, I'm not going to be quiet. People may laugh at me. People may make mockery of me, but they will know where I stand. They will know what my mind is. So Peter and John, Stand before this august situation of group and they're not intimidated. And the passage says, it tells us why they are not intimidated. It says that the disarhindry listened to these people and they took notice of them. They had been with Jesus. That was their secret. The secret is they have being with Jesus. So maybe somewhere in the discussion, somebody asks, ah, why are these fishermen bold? And somebody say, I think they were with Jesus. And then the other person say, I, I, th I think we saw them with Jesus. So the, the impression you get from this is that this is how Jesus was. This is how Jesus was. Because these guys had judged Jesus not long before then. He had stood before them. He had spoken. They had presented themselves. Himself. He's been crucified. So they knew the Jesus prototype. They knew the Jesus model. That if you have been with Jesus, you must be like Jesus. So question is, are we with Jesus? Are you with Jesus? Then if you are with Jesus, then there is no audience that should intimidate you. There is no meeting you should be asked to speak where you say, uh, uh, um, um, what I'm saying, it may not make sense, but what kind of speech is that? What I'm saying is it will make sense. If it will make sense, don't say it. <laughs> but if you've been with Jesus, then no matter your state, when you are asked to present yourself, you present yourself as Jesus would. <laughs> Bold. Speak freely, think freely, freely express yourself. And that is what a Jesus person does. A Christian is a bold person. A Christian is somebody who is so strong in Christ 
that no audience intimidates them. So the next time you're before a crowd, think I am with Jesus and Jesus is with me. In fact, that the construction of the sentence they have been uh, with Jesus means first that they were companions of Jesus. They had been friends of Jesus. But it has another dimension in the meaning. It means they were in continuous contact with Jesus. So although Jesus had died, been resurrected, ascended to heaven, and was not physically with them, they were with him all the time. Being with Jesus is not something that happened in the past of their lives. It was a continuous experience. In prayer, they were with him. In study, they were with him. As they memorized his words and they listened to his words, they were with him. Every time you pray, every time you study the word, you are with Jesus. And his boldness becomes your boldness. Boldness to freely express yourself and not be intimidated by the audience, the crowd that is around you. In the days ahead, some of you will be called before big bodies. Maybe you stand before an interview panel. To be interviewed, you are with Jesus and Jesus is with you. Don't be a bush person. Don't be an idiotis. Don't be a grammatos. Be like a person who is with Jesus. The interview panel may be far better educated than you are, but you are with the ruler of the universe. You are with the word that began all things. You are with Jesus. Maybe one day, you may have to make a speech before a group. Whatever the group is, it may be a political speech or it may be a speech somewhere at the conference. They say, this is the Ghanaian aspect. On so and so, let him come and speak. Please, don't speak like a Ghanaian. Speak like a person who is with Jesus. People should be able to come and say, wow, we've never had anybody like you. Where did you go to school? Now, normally when people ask that question, they want you to say, I went to Harvard. I went to Yale. I went to Oxford or Cambridge. You just tell them, I'm with Jesus. Where, where did you go to school? I learned from Jesus. You say, you learned from whom? Jesus. How did you learn from Jesus? I talk to him every day. I study him every day. I listen to him every day. I pray to him every day. I am with him all the time. And he's with me all the time. That's the source of my boldness. Thank God for universities. Thank God for good schools. Some of us went to schools that we can be proud of. Some of us went to schools that have a name. Whether your school has a name or it's a no-name school, you are with Jesus. And don't allow anybody to put you down because they think you are not smart enough. If you are with Jesus, you are the smartest person in the room. If you are with Jesus, you are the most confident person in the room. If you are with Jesus, he makes all the difference. And after Peter and John had spoken, there was nothing else they could say. They couldn't 
overruled them. They defended themselves so well. Of course, they were whipped after that. <laughs> they were beaten. When somebody cannot win the argument, all they can do is physically assault you. Because they can't win the argument. They beat them, and then they went back to the other disciples and reported what had happened. And they said, let us pray together. And you know what their prayer was? They said, Lord, grant to us boldness. Because they realized boldness is the key for expressing the newfound faith that they have. And that's the kind of boldness I pray Christians would have that we can boldly talk about Jesus. You can boldly stand for Jesus. At your party, you boldly talk about Jesus. When you are in your office, you boldly talk about Jesus. When people ask, how come you are so smart? You tell them, Jesus. Let Jesus be the source of your success. Let Jesus be the answer you give to those who require answers of you. Yes, you have all the school and you have all the education and you have all of that. But without Jesus, none of that matters anyway. People have gone to good schools and have ended up doing nothing with their lives. But when you are with Jesus, when Jesus is with you, he's your strength, he's your wisdom, he's your boldness, and he'll take you places. So this morning I pray for each one of you. For wherever you stand in life, may you shine. May you shine. May, may you be an exceptional person. May you be exceptional in your office. May you be exceptional at every interview. May you be exceptional at every gathering. Whenever you stand to speak, may you be exceptional. May God showcase you. May you be bold and never intimidated. And may the Spirit of Christ rest upon you wherever you are, in every forum, in every situation, at every place. And may you never shrink back, never shrink back, but stand tall to declare the Word of God in the place that He has put you. Father, we pray for the spirit of boldness as it fell upon Peter and John. Let that same spirit of boldness rest upon everyone here, wherever they function, in their lives, in their homes, in their schools, in their offices, wherever they are. Raise up in this place bold men and women who are not intimidated by the elites in their society. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.